Hi guys, welcome back to the Dr. Cliff AUD vlog. This is vlog number 76, and I'm gonna apologize right now because this will probably be the worst vlog that I ever do. I got about five hours of sleep last night. I've been traveling all day, and it's about almost midnight here back at home. Um, I think I've been awake for like 21 hours or something like that at this point, so I'm just gonna apologize right off the bat. Um, of course, Give me that thumbs up button if uh, if you're in full support of me still doing these vlogs because um, I know I missed last week and some of you may have liked that, some of you may have missed it. Um, but last week was just a crazy week. Uh, my car that I've had for a long time has about, or had about 216,000 miles on it, ended up dying last week. So we're in this process of trying to find a new vehicle. Um, what else happened? My cousin got married. So there just wasn't a whole lot of time last weekend to do my vlog, let alone record my other videos that I was actually able to get done. Um, and I can just tell that I'm not like talking. I'm kind of like slurring my words right now. So let me just tell you what I've been up to. Um, let's see, uh, Friday morning, I got ready to go to Florida because in Florida there was this thought leader summit for Cognivue. Now I've talked about Cognivue uh, in some of my videos before. Um, basically it's this whole concept of doing cognitive screening for hearing loss uh, patients. And uh, we had it at the American Institute of Balance, Dr. Richard Gann's clinic, uh, the biggest uh, dizziness and balance clinic in the world um, and just a really fantastic facility. And, and if you're a, someone who has issues with dizziness, uh, going to, I think it's uh, dizzy.com or uh, something like that. If you Google Richard Gans and, and, and you know what, I'll link it in the description below. I can't think straight right now. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, the, let's talk about what we talked about at this training that I went to. Um, you know, a lot about cognition, a lot about this aspect of how hearing is done with the brain. There's a lot more that goes into hearing than just testing pure tone beep thresholds, right? And I think that, you know, we get kind of stuck in our ways of practicing audiology the way that we've done it for decades. And in the world, in the in the profession of audiology is changing. The, the, the way that we treat hearing loss, we now realize that there's so many other aspects that go into it, so many different cognitive aspects. And you know, when we have this data coming out from researchers like Dr. Anu Sharma, where she's showing that your brain literally changes the way that it processes information when you have a hearing loss, and that if you re-stimulate the brain with you know amplified hearing, essentially, you can get that cortical reorganization to go back to the way that it's supposed to be. And and you know, also talking about this other aspect of you know hearing in complex listening situations, or just having difficulty hearing, but it doesn't even show up on a hearing test. Because when you go into a noisy listening environment, the thing that you don't realize is that it requires a lot of cognitive effort to be able to fight through the background noise. And you could have you know the best hearing aids program perfectly, and everything tells us that you should do awesome in a noisy situation. And then if you still do bad, there's gotta be some reason behind that. And what they're starting to identify is that this whole cognitive processing aspect has a lot to do with how well you actually hear. And you can have individuals, like I mentioned before, that have completely normal hearing. So normal pure tone thresholds, normal word recognition scores, normal speech and noise scores, and then they go into a noisy situation or, or any situation and they just can't process the information effectively because you just don't realize how much effect the brain has on your overall ability to hear. Now, something that we need to be careful about is we can't say that, you know, hearing loss causes dementia and uh, or, you know, that it's it's something that will definitely lead to it and that if you treat your hearing loss that you can prevent dementia, like you can't say anything like that. But there's some really strong correlative data out there that kind of shows that you know the leading potentially modifiable risk factor that exists for dementia is hearing loss. And the Lancet Commission you know, came out uh, reporting this, I think in 2017 was the first time they've kind of had, you know, subsequent, you know, revisits of this this topic of what are all of the different risk factors that go in to developing dementia or Alzheimer's disease and all of that. And hearing loss routinely comes out on the top 
of that list for these risk factors that you can modify. And there's and there's several other risk factors that you can modify, and you should modify those as well, like you know excessive drinking, smoking. Um, you know, education level, like all of those things are things that you can do to mitigate the risk of, of developing dementia. But, you know, I think that we are just the tip of the iceberg right now. You know, the thing that we all want to identify is, okay, like, is it causal? Is hearing loss causal for dementia? You know, is it causal for cognitive decline? And we just don't know the answer to that yet. And, and you know, there ha there's a lot smarter people out there than I am who are trying to find the answer to that question. And if the question's no, like if, it, let's say that they identify that treatment of hearing loss has absolutely no impact on your ability to remain cognitively there and it, you know not have dementia. I mean, if, if that's the answer, then that's fine, but we still need to find the answer. And, and I think that there's a lot of research going on right now that is looking into that specifically. And then when you talk about the Cogniview, like the Cogniview is this computerized screening tool for cognitive decline. And, and it measures a variety of different aspects like memory, uh, reaction time, processing speed, executive function, and visuospatial ability. And when you can measure all of these domains and do it in a computerized fashion that removes bias out of the measurements and something that's quick, something that can be administered inside of a visit, um, that's something that is, it, it could be extremely impactful and something that I've been doing in my clinic for about the past six months now um, on, on individuals who kind of exhibit some concern of, of difficulty with speech and noise, but is, they're not really showing those signs on their hearing test or someone who has family history of cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, uh, anything like that. And what I kind of came back with from this weekend is that I should probably be doing cognitive screening on every single patient who comes into the clinic because it is so sensitive that we may be able to identify different areas, areas of mild cognitive impairment and something that we can keep an eye on and monitor as time goes by. And not only that, the ability to participate in the ongoing research and identifying, you know, are these, these variables that we're, we can measure, are they having, are, are they like showing us something? You know, like I don't even know all the different things that they're looking for, but if I could contribute my data to that data set um, for the research that they're doing with the Cogniview, I think that it gets us to a potential answer and a more you know, uh, reliable and valid answer sooner. So that's kind of what I've been up to this last weekend. Just a lot of talk, uh, you, you know, hearing conversations from people who are way, way smarter than I am in this field. Um, and, but you know what? I think that as soon as we feel like we're comfortable in, in what we're doing, then we're probably being left behind. And, you know, I've prided myself on following best practices in my clinic and doing everything the best I possibly can. You know, it's, it's daunting and overwhelming, this as, the aspect of constantly trying to learn new things and, and do things at the top of, of what my capabilities are. And, uh, and it's tough and it's, uh, it's something that, um, kind of, you know, it, it gets me a little discouraged at times because there's so much information out there and I've only scratched the surface at this point. And I'm just, you know, uh, I'm just trying to kind of hang on and, and see what things could I continue to do better. Because if you're not trying to do better, then you're, you're basically getting worse, if you ask me. So I don't want to get stuck in this rut of just practicing audiology the way that I, I always have because I just believe that that's the right way to do it. I need to challenge myself and kind of step outside of my comfort zone sometimes. But... Now is really not the time to talk about my comfort zone in audiology. It's something that I, I really love to do. It's something that I do feel like I'm good at, something I am passionate about. Um, I just need to step up my game and get even better at it for my patients. So um, that being said, that is pretty much all I can handle at this point. This is going to be a really short vlog, but I'm like fighting to stay awake here. I'm surprised I have this much energy to be even talking about it right now. Ashley already went to bed after picking me up at the airport at like 10.30 or 11 o'clock or whatever time it is right now. My dog Charlie's over here on the ground asleep. But I really wanted to get this vlog in because I didn't get one in last week. So um, with that said, guys, I greatly appreciate it. Go ahead and give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. And as always, I will see you next week.